Welcome fellow freaks, geeks, and nostalgic 90s nerds to my channel, Slime and Slashers, where, yep, you may have guessed it, we talk about everything from Nickelodeon Slime to horror movie slashers and lots of stuff in between too though. We talk books, movies, TV, and plenty of other random stuff too as it comes up, like beer! I'll actually be talking a little bit about beer today in this video. But today's video is not just about beer, because that's a little tiny part of it, what it's really about is my April and May reading wrap up. Plus I'll give you a little sneak peek into my June TBR as well as like two titles on my July TBR. So right after this intro, I'll see you back here and we'll get right into it. Welcome back guys. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about what I read in the months of April and May. And because a lot of other booktubers read a lot more in one month, I waited two months to do my reading wrap up because I kind of read slow. So I read 13 books throughout April and May. And so, you know, that might be a little less than most people read in the span of two months. However, for me, 13 books is pretty great. So I'm proud of what I read. And you know, some of them were short, but still. I am not going to take that away from me or hold that against me or anything because I am really happy with what I read. And overall, everything that I read, I pretty much enjoyed, I gotta say. So it was relatively successful in terms of my enjoyment and the books I picked out. So I'd give it pretty much, if I had to give it a letter grade of enjoyment, I'd say an A, A minus, because there was a lot of 3.5 star rates in there. So as we go through what I read, unfortunately, I don't have a physical copy of every single book. In fact, the first few that I'm going to talk about, I read, I checked them out from the library. So I don't have them with me anymore. I returned them. And so I won't have them to hold up. But I'll put a picture in because I am an editor and I can do editing magic. So when the time is appropriate, I will pop up a picture either here beside me or this will go to it full. We'll see. You never know what editing Kelsey's gonna want to do, right? I don't know. So we'll see what happens in editing. But first, let's get to my first read, which was my probably one of my favorite reads of the entire two month span, and that is The Elementals by Michael McDowell. Oh! <laughs> that sounded like a weird noise, but it was my first Michael McDowell read, and oh my gosh, was it amazing. I really loved it. It was a haunted house type of story, and the good thing is, though, it was a different type of Haunted House story because it took place in the summertime and in like a lot of heat. The heat was described so vividly. I felt it like I was there sweating alongside the characters. And the book kind of focuses on two families, the McCray family and the Savage family. And then they're the ones who own these uh, set of three houses that are on Alabama's Gulf Coast. And so they go out there and they take a vacation. But the whole thing is that there's been some haunting stuff that they've seen there over the years. And so now, you know, they're experiencing it again. More crazy stuff happens. And so some of it's kind of subtle. So McDowell is just a master storyteller. Sometimes, you know, you're going along, but you never feel bored. I never felt bored once in this book, even though, you know, it took a while for the creepiness to hit. But when it hit, it hit so perfectly. Like, it was in-your-face creepy. There was this one scene described, and there was sand involved, and just, I saw the scene so vividly in my mind, as if it was like a movie playing out in front of me. Just, that's how great McDowell's descriptions were in this book. So, I gotta say, I highly recommend it. I actually gave it a five-star rating on Goodreads, so a five out of five. I didn't round it up. It was a flat five stars. That's how much I enjoyed it. And I can't wait to read more McDowell titles. In fact, after reading that, even though I don't physically own a copy of The Elementals, I kind of went out and went crazy and bought a whole bunch of other McDowell titles, including Cold Moon Over Babylon. I bought his Blackwater Saga. It's in a big bind-up that was released from Valancourt Books. So I'm excited to read that, but I will not get to that big series this year. There's no way. But one day I will get to Blackwater. I'm very excited. I actually also bought The Amulet, written by Michael McDowell. I can't wait to get to that one. In fact, that'll probably be my next Michael McDowell read. I don't know when I'll get to it, but that will definitely be the next one. And then I'll decide, you know, which will be after that when the time comes. You know, I don't have to decide now. I don't really like to give too much away about these stories. So as I go through what I've read, I may or may not read the description 
either on Goodreads or on the back of the book, depending on if I have a physical copy or not. I'm just not big into summarizing. You know, a lot of times if you want to read the summary, you can go look it up yourselves, but I'll, I'll read it for you. I just don't like summarizing it in my own words a lot of times because I'd rather give my analysis of it. And my analysis of the elementals was it was so atmospheric, so effective with its horror, but I will say it was a mix between in-your-face horror with some scenes, but still not over the top, not overly gory, but enough to be scary and eerie, I would say. That's a good description. Eerie, I think, is a good word, almost the perfect type of word to describe the book and how it made you feel and the type of horror it is. And so, yeah, I'd say why not give it a shot if you haven't read any of McDowell's works? Start with this one. It's great. And also, it's a perfect summer read because as I was reading it, I might amend that because maybe if you don't want to feel hot, you shouldn't read it because it will make you feel hotter than you already feel if you're sitting there in some summer heat, some summer sun. Here in Louisiana, you know, the book's set in Alabama, but I can relate so much as I was reading the book. They were describing how hot it was because they didn't have AC in these houses when they were, you know, at the McRae and Savage houses that were on the Gulf Coast that are kind of like eerily haunted. They didn't have AC. They didn't have electricity, really. So they just talk about how stifling that heat is there. And even though, like I said, I live in Louisiana, I can still relate. Alabama's not that far. Southern heat, it's the same type of heat. Humidity is high. It is overwhelming. It is almost like debilitating how hot it can get. I mean, it's hot here right now and we're only in the beginning of June and it's only going to get worse. So yeah, I would, if you're looking for something summery, this definitely has a summery feel. Lots of descriptions of like, you know, just how how hot it is and the, the beach kind of because the, the houses are set on the beach so there's a lot of description of that so it gives you that summer vibe and I like that I will say though my one little thing is there are things that are left unanswered at the end I feel like and that doesn't bother me though with this book for some reason but other reads that I'm going to talk about even today on this list that I read in the last two months those books left things unanswered and it bothered me more. I don't know why that is. Maybe I'm being like hypocritical or biased or something, but for me, like I could overlook the very, very end, which left some things unexplained. For some reason, I don't know why that didn't bother me. Usually it does bother me, but in that case with the elementals, it didn't. I don't know. Go figure. I, I have no idea how to explain it. All right, so moving right along. Already, I'm being long-winded. I'm, I'm sorry. This is just who I am. And also, by the way, as I'm going along, if you've read any of these titles, please comment below what you thought of whichever ones you've read. And if you haven't read any, please let me know which ones sound good to you. Uh, and then maybe we could have a back and forth discussion about it because uh, most of these I would recommend. Uh, there's not one that I would say, stay away. And that's a spoiler, I guess, because I haven't gone through them all. But I don't believe there's one that I, I dislike. There's just ones that I liked less than other ones. That's all. All right, the next book I'm going to talk about, Night Things by Michael Talbot. And I got to say, as much as I loved The Elementals, I really didn't love night things. Now, it wasn't terrible. In fact, the ending saved it, in my opinion. It really picked up towards the end, and then it was satisfying because things were happening, things were spooky, things were crazy. But overall, I just did not like it because of the characters. The characters were not well-rounded. They were not likable. I just could not get invested in them. So the story follows a woman who just married this very famous singer. And so they're kind of figuring out their relationship. They're kind of like in the honeymoon phase of their relationship, let's say, since they just got married. But she has a son from a previous relationship. And so it's kind of difficult because the guy isn't used to the son. So basically, they all three have to get used to being together now that the man and woman are married. The guy's got to get used to this new kid who's going to be around all the time. And it doesn't really go smoothly. That's one little aspect of the novel. But the other big aspect is the three of them go to take a vacation at this house called Lake House. And that's where the bulk of the story takes place. And this is where it gets cool, is the house itself. I will say, so before I read this, I was intrigued because lots of people compare the house in Night Things to House of Leaves and that house. And to me, I don't agree with it at all. The one thing they have in common is that both houses in both books are bigger on the inside than they are on the outside. To me, the similarities, they stop there because totally different styles of books. 
I have read House of Leaves and it's just written in a very academic, strange, wacky, crazy, zany way. Whereas Night Things, like, traditionally written like a horror fiction novel. It's not got any kind of weird flair in the writing style. Whereas House of Leaves definitely does. So that's one big difference right there. Like I said, the houses also are completely different. Although that they've got that one thing in common, the bigger on the inside than the outside, House of Leaves house constantly expands. It's got all kinds of mystery to it. Whereas the Night Things house, it just has some weirdness to the rooms, but it doesn't have things pop up. It doesn't have the same mystery surrounding it as the house and House of Leaves. In fact, just the house isn't as cool in Night Things as the house in House of Leaves. And eventually we discover a little more about the house in Night Things, which is called Lake House, like I referenced before. So here is what the blurb says on Goodreads, and I imagine this is what the back of the book said. Again, this was a library read for me, so I don't have it with me. But Goodreads says, Welcome to Lake House, a sprawling great camp with 160 rooms, each carpeted in evil and painted with human blood. Enter if you dare. Explore the miles of dark, twisting hallways reeking with the stench of death. Journey through a bizarre labyrinth into the chambers of unearthly proportions, up creaking stairways leading nowhere, but never, never venture into the black heart of the awesome edifice you may never leave. For creatures roam the corridors of Lake House, hideous beings older than civilization. Restless, waiting, hungry, blood-chilling denizens of hell that emerge only under the cover of darkness. Things that will haunt your dreams and devour your soul. Now, that description sounds badass. I gotta say, the book did not live up to the description. However, I got through it, the end got better, but like I said, the problem I have is with the characters. And like the mother and son and the, I guess you could say, stepfather now, he, I just didn't like how they interacted with one another. The woman got mad because the new husband wasn't really getting along with her son, and she was feeling very defensive about that. That I could understand, but what I didn't understand is how internally she also was weirded out by her own son. Just because the kid is scientific, and he's also interested in paranormal things, she's all freaked out by him. So she's getting mad at her new husband for not liking her son, but yet she's thinking that her son is weird and really is kind of having negative thoughts about him too. But I will say her husband was a dick. So, pardon my French, but yeah. So she was right in being annoyed with him because we find out, and this is not really a spoiler, he's just not the coolest guy. And whatever. Stuff ensues with the house though. It's more about the house itself, but for me the characters just made it drag on. I didn't like them. I didn't like the way they were written. And I just, I couldn't get invested in any of them because I didn't really like any of them very much, except for the kid who I did most like. If it wouldn't have been for the ending, I would have rated it a 3. But because of the end, I rated it a 3.5 out of 4. And I rounded it, uh, I think I rounded it up on Goodreads to 4 stars. But it's really a 3.5 star read for me. So yeah, House of Leaves comparison, I think, is a little weak. I don't see it. I really don't see it besides one little thing in common with the houses that are talked about in each book. Other than that, completely different and I just can't believe someone made that comparison. Then after that, I read a really insane book, Let's Go Play at the Adamses by Mendel W. Johnson. And I will say, it was super difficult to get through. It made me feel a lot of emotions, mostly frustration, anger. I was kind of puzzled and dumbfounded at parts because I just didn't understand why these kids were so effing brutal and how they could be such psychopaths. I had no idea, like, how can you be like that? Now, I reviewed this on my channel, so you can go back and watch that review. I'll link it up here. However, I also wrote a very lengthy and extensive and thorough review on my blog, KelseyExplains.com, and I'll put a link right here. So I actually think that my written review is much better because I had more time to ruminate on the story. I had more time to think about how I really felt about the book and the story because, yeah, it's disturbing. Essentially, it's about these kids who take their babysitter captive. Their parents are gone away for quite a few days, and so they say, oh, this is our chance to kind of get control and have power over an adult. Let's take her captive and see what we can do. You know, torture ensues, and it just, God, they just descend into 
brutality and meanness and oh my god they're the worst i really don't like them so i'm not going to say too much about it here but there's lots of triggers so i would be careful if you decide to read it we have like torture and rape and just kids being assholes and what's frustrating is the part that i didn't like about the book was the explanations or lack thereof or the examination or lack thereof of the children's psyches and why they were doing what they were doing it was kind of left unexplained and the explanations that Johnson did try to give I just didn't buy into it and think it was realistic in the least now I've heard this book compared to Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door and I do plan on reading that so I can compare the two some people say they're very similar, while others say they're not alike at all, totally different in feel and style, and the only thing they have in common are that they're both loosely based on a real-life story, which is really insanely horrific that it's based on a true story, both of the stories based on a true story. That's insane to me because how can humankind really be that brutal? But alas, apparently, humans are capable of insanely terrible things, as we know, sadly. So yeah, that some people say that that's the only similarity was the story that both of them are based on. So I'm going to see for myself when I eventually do read it. But yeah, lots of people feel quite differently about this. I feel like it's a very polarizing book. Some people hate it. Some people are like, wow, it shocked me. And I like the shock value aspect of it. And also they thought it had like a a bigger meaning type of thing as well but you know I I kind of fell in the middle to where I'll always remember it but again it was more because of the shock value type of action in the book I feel like it was really kind of cringeworthy at parts but also boring funnily enough at parts too some of it was really slow and boring and you would think that wouldn't go hand in hand with the horrific subject matter but somehow it does again check out my review for more of my thoughts uh, I gave it a three on Goodreads, but I rounded it down from a 3.5. So technically my full rating is a 3.5 rounded down for Goodreads. All right. So after flipping Let's Go Play at the Adamses, I wanted something light and fun and quick and easy. So I picked up my Goosebumps reread that I've been working on for a little while. And I call it a reread, but it's not technically a reread because a lot of Goosebump books, I did own them as a kid and I still have them all. That's what I'm reading are my childhood copies, but I actually didn't read them. So some of them I did, maybe like three or four, but I really didn't dig into a lot of them. So some of them are rereads, but most of them are reads for the first time. And that includes this one, which I had never read before, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, Goosebumps number five, love the cover art. This was exactly what I needed after Let's Go Play at the Adamses. It gave me a nice jolt of nostalgia, a nice jolt of just mindless fun and happiness and just very light, very airy of a read. I liked that. I needed it so bad after that first read of Let's Go Play at the Adamses. It was just too hardcore and too kind of dragging you down and making you very upset and angry. Especially, I felt anger the most. But this was so much fun. I will read you the description. It says, Gabe just got lost in a pyramid. One minute, his crazy cousin, Sari, was right ahead of him in the pyramid tunnel. Next minute, she's disappeared. But Gabe isn't alone. Someone else is in the pyramid, too. Someone or something. Gabe doesn't believe in the curse of the mummy's tomb. But that doesn't mean that the curse isn't real. Does it? So... I had such a fun time with this one. It surprised me a lot because, you know, mummies aren't really my favorite thing ever, but I had such a good time with this. Not only did it have mummies, it also had some creepy crawly bug scenes. It had a human antagonist as well, and it just was what I needed at the time. So I gave this a 4.5 and I rounded it down to a 4 for Goodreads. I mean, how can you say anything negative about most Goosebumps? Now, some are better than the others, I will admit that, but overall, any Goosebumps book is going to be a quick, easy, and just light and airy read. That is always a good time. Okay, and the next book I read, I don't have a physical copy of this one either because I read it on Kindle. It is Collected Easter Horror Shorts presented by Kevin J. Kennedy. I love this one. It had some flaws, yes. But it also had a ton of positives, and the biggest positive was the creativity that was featured in every single story. Yes, you'll have, inevitably, stories that are stronger than others, and that is true for any collection of stories or any anthology. This one's no different in that sense. You're going to have ones that you just don't like as much as other ones. That doesn't bother me. I know that going in to these types of books. So 
but the thing that they all had in common was the creativity that they all included. Just so many good things. And in fact, here are some things that were featured in some of these stories. And I wrote this on my Goodreads review. It had killer jelly beans, monster peeps, stories of resurrection gone wrong, zombie-like bunny creatures, chilling children, a sinister scavenger hunt, and a claw machine filled with toys crawling with life with a desire to escape. Plus much more. I mean, you would think that there's like, that's it? No, no, there's like a ton more stories. It was just jam-packed with stories. One of my favorite stories was called Easter Eggs, which was about a young boy who befriended an elderly neighbor. And so they all, him and the elderly neighbor have to stand up to his mom's boyfriend who's really abusive and just a terrible guy. He's such a freaking douchebag. So the neighbor and the boy team up and they have some unexpected help from some kind of Easter themed creature. What could it be? And what do they do to the mom's boyfriend? Do they end up defeating him? You'll have to read it to find out. I love that story. Another story I liked was more of like a revenge type of story, and that was called The Last Supper. Friends are gathering together to have a nice little dinner party, but things kind of go awry, and some unexpected stuff happens. Lots of gore in that one. I, I really enjoyed that one. Lots of very vivid, gross imagery. Then finally, my last favorite was Hatch, and this was great. It was kind of about a egg that looked really homely and just plain and ugly. An Easter egg, of course. But there's more to that egg than meets the eye. So stuff happens. Obviously, it's hinted at by the word hatch. And uh, yeah, it goes downhill from there. I feel bad for whoever finds that egg. The whole collection was quite fun. I will say there were some spelling errors on the Kindle version. I don't know if the print version would have been like that, but that was a little distracting because it happened a lot. And I'm talking about spelling errors as in, you know, they have a word that sounds the same, but they spell it the wrong version of the words, like there and there, or two and two. Peace and peace was one that I know happened, was P-I-E. C-E or P-E-A-C-E. -E. I forgot which one they were supposed to use, but they used the opposite one. I was like, uh-oh, no. All right, before we move on, let's talk about the beer I'm drinking right now. So book wrap up and beer. So I'm drinking out of a St. Arnold class, which is a brewery from Texas. Very awesome brewery. My friend Lenny works there and he's awesome. And the beer is amazing. But the beer I'm drinking is not from St. Arnold. The beer I'm drinking is actually from a Shreveport, Louisiana brewery called Great Raft. And Shreveport is about five and a half hours away from the New Orleans area, which I live close to. So it's quite a haul. Brewery is really cool. What I'm drinking specifically is called 318, and here is the can, even though I'm drinking out of a glass. This is what the can looks like. So it is a golden ale with strawberry, and this reminds me a lot of, you guys might have heard of Abita Brewery, and that is the most famous and most popular Louisiana brewery. It's a really big one. It's almost like a chain type of brewery in a way, and that's how big it is, but it's there's not really multiple locations, but it's just so well known and so big. But this one reminds me a lot of their strawberry lager, but this one actually has more strawberry flavor my opinion. Usually I don't like light beers that much anymore, but sometimes I will drink them. This one's super light. Definitely has a strawberry flavor though. I like usually browns and amber ales and stuff of that nature, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to have a light beer every now and then. So I would recommend it. It's delicious. I was actually up in Shreveport for a number of different reasons. One, wanted to try some new breweries, including Great Raft, which is where the beer is from, like I said, but also I went to a used bookstore, which was pretty great. And I'm going to have a book haul coming up in a week or two, or maybe a few weeks. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. But I've got a whole haul from that out-of-town bookstore from Shreveport. So that's something to look forward to. Beer and book hauls and beer and books and book talk just goes together so well, at least in my opinion. So that's why I'm drinking my beer right now and relaxing. Okay. Thank you for humoring me on that. I just wanted to, to feature my beer. Anyway, so lots of fun stuff. And by the way, I did rate that collected Easter horror shorts collection. I rated it 3.5, but I rounded it up to four on Goodreads. So overall, very fun, but the spelling stuff held it back a little bit. Plus some of the stories I wasn't super invested in, but like I said, that's nothing strange, nothing unusual for anthologies and collections. All right, and so the next book I read was The Nest by Gregory A. Douglas, and oh my god, I love that read. It's about killer cockroaches, so 
And also about the small town dealing with the killer cockroaches. How will they overcome? Will they overcome? And so that's really at the heart of the story. It's about people. It's not just, oh, roaches, roaches, roaches with nothing substantial. I did think it had a little more to it. And I actually did a whole extensive video review of it on my YouTube. I'll link it up here. And if you want to see me hang out and do stupid shit with a inflatable pool float that is shaped like a roach, then check out the review because I do really stupid stuff with it and whatever. I had a blast filming that review. It's one of my favorite reviews I've ever done on my YouTube channel. Even though, you know, I haven't done too many book reviews, it's probably one of my favorite reviews of if either a book or a movie. So that, that actually expands the pool of reviews to a quite larger number. So it's one of my favorite things I've ever covered, period. I love the book. So gruesome in its prose and descriptions, but also almost to like a poetic and cheesy level, which kind of might bother some readers, but it didn't bother me. I actually quite enjoyed the the really beautiful descriptions, and it sounds so weird talking about beautiful descriptions. It was, I would say it's beautiful but bloody at the same time, if that makes sense. And uh, you can hear some of the quotes because I read a, quite a few of them in my review, so if you do check it out, you'll hear me reading some of these quotes. It might bother some people, it didn't bother me at all. I think it added to it, to be honest. I think it just gave it a whole other layer of, wow, this is really well written. And I don't think it was written in a way with such flowery language to be pompous. I think it was written that way though as a nice contrast on purpose because you've got that gross subject matter of roaches which are really uh, bleh, make you want to barf. You really can't stand the idea of them which really adds to the whole idea of how scary the story really is and how horrific and gross it is but at the same time you're using all of this you know eloquent very fine language poetic flowery as I described a second ago. I just think it mixes really well, personally. I think it was a successful combination of the two different weird things. Roaches, poeticness. It was awesome. I loved it. Like I said, almost a five star, but it lost half a star because of freaking scientific bullshit. So next, finally, I've got a physical copy I could show you. I read a nice short novella because I wanted something short and quick after I had read The Nest and a whole bunch of other paperbacks from hell type of reads. I wanted to read a more modern book. So this is by Haley Piper. And I had heard a lot of good things about this. This is The Possession of Natalie Glasgow. I love possession stories. It's some of my favorite type of horror stories. I mean, I'm a big fan of The Exorcist, both the book and the movie. I think they're great especially The Exorcist, uh, the movie, is one of my favorite films of all time, especially my favorite horror films. The book's even better, though, honestly. It gives you a whole other layer of information. So whenever I see anything about Possession, I kind of, like, gravitate towards it. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll check it out. I heard that this was a lot different than most Possession stories, and that piqued my interest. I was like, what do they mean that it's unique and different? And possession is Possession, right? There is a little bit of a twist here, a little bit of a different element to this possession story. It's not your same old possession story. However, I do have some minor criticisms of the book. I enjoyed it. I don't want to make it seem like I didn't like it. I very much did like it. But what held it back to me was the lack of some more in-depth characterization. And I think that just is like due to the short nature of the book. You see how thin it is? It was basically only about 100 pages long. And so how much can you really go into detail at only 100 pages? Not much. I really wanted to know more about Natalie and, you know, how she started acting at the beginning of the possession. So the main characters really are Natalie and her mother, and her mother is trying to consult this other medium lady who's almost like, she's almost like an exorcist liaison because she's not the person who does an exorcist she's the person who determines if an exorcist should be done and so her and the mother are kind of trying to figure out what to do about natalie we're kind of like thrown in the midst of everything i would love more details more characterization but overall very fun definitely different although i did see uh what was different i saw that coming a mile away um, when I started to get near the end. But that that's not really, that never bothers me. That happens to me a lot, and I never hold that against the author. I'm just good at guessing things sometimes. So I gave this a 3.5, but I rounded it up on Goodreads to a four-star read, and I do recommend it. I think Haley Piper's great, and there's another book by her out that I'd love to read, which is also very short, which I think has a more, like, a supernatural alien type of theme, if I remember correctly.
All right, guys, next up, I read 12 Nights at Rotter House by J.W. Oker. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Maybe J.W. Ocker. I am so bad at pronunciation, even after I've heard these names pronounced like in other videos and stuff. What is wrong with me? Well, anyway, I picked this book to read with my friend Teresa. We did a buddy read together and she let me pick. I gave her two choices. It was this one and another, I think it was another haunted house type of story. And she picked this one. And we both kind of had the same feelings about it, I came to find out later. But as I was reading, I really did like it. There was tons of horror movie and actually horror fiction references throughout the book. Because it focuses on a travel writer named Felix who decides to go and stay 13 nights at a local haunted house called Rotter House. And he wants to document his time there and he wants to see if... By spending so much time there and really immersing himself in this supposedly haunted house, if he will become a believer in, like, you know, the supernatural. If he experiences anything that will change his mind because he's a skeptic. And so he wants to write this whole book and he wants to change his circumstances because he's not doing so well with his travel writing and his horror travel writing at the time that he decides to stay there. And it's affecting his relationship. Also, another element to the story is his best friend, who he hasn't talked to in a long time because they had a falling out. The best friend comes and joins him to stay at Rotter House, and they kind of hang out there together, and part of the story involves them kind of trying to hash out what happened between them and try to make up. And so that's a whole other element. There are lots of things that I love about the book, but there are some things that I don't like about it. One of the main criticisms I have is that some of the story kind of drags a little bit because not only do we hear a lot of the inner monologue of Felix, the main character, who's there to write his story about staying at the house, you know, we hear all of his inner workings of, you know, explaining why he's a skeptic and... It just goes on and on. Um, also, there's endless dialogue between him and his best friend while they're at the house talking about, you know, how can you be a skeptic? Well, I believe, you know, everything can be explained and this and that. Again, it's all about the skepticism that they kind of analyze and overanalyze at nauseum. And also, just basically the main character, Felix, ruminating in his mind about the best way to write the story and he keeps going on and on about that sometimes he'll talk about it to his best friend other times he'll internally think about the best way to write it so that that part i didn't like but when the horror parts hit and the creepy parts hit it's effective it's really awesome it's enjoyable and I gotta say, the references, though, I think, as I mentioned earlier, are the things that stick out the most. I, that's the thing I enjoyed the most. Specifically, one thing I wrote in my Goodreads review, which I'll put up for you to see right now, there's this wonderful, wonderful scene where Felix is describing this room he finds that is filled with creepy porcelain dolls. And during this scene, Felix kind of takes a quote from the movie Jaws and flips it on its head. In Twelve Nights at Rotter House, and this is never like called attention to that he's quoting Jaws, and he says, Good old custom made for horror movie dolls with old fashioned dresses, porcelain faces, lifeless eyes black eyes like a shark's eyes and so this perfectly perfectly mirrors the quote from jaws when quint is doing his whole indianapolis speech and he's talking about the shark's eyes but he compares it to a doll's eyes so it's like reversed so in 12 nights at rotter house jw ochre kind of does this whole little wink thing where he's almost quoting jaws but he changes one word and so while quint compares a shark's eyes to a doll's Felix in the book, the character Felix, compares the doll's eyes to a shark's. So it's really wonderful. But here's the actual quote from Jaws. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eyes. I have that freaking speech almost memorized. And so that's why I recognized it right away when I'm reading it. I'm like, oh my God, that's just like the, the Jaws monologue, except one word has changed. Amazing. It was my favorite part of the whole book was that one little part. And then they start singing that awesome song. Show me the way to go home. Boom, boom, boom. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago and it's gone right to my head. Anyway, don't get me started on the music in Jaws. I'll start singing that. I'll start singing the Fair Spanish Lady song. You know, farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Anyway, you don't want to hear it. Kelsey karaoke is not a good thing. 
but people enjoy making fun of it on my live streams on Twitch sometimes, so why not throw some of that karaoke in here? What ifs? Hopefully you book peeps won't mind too much. Anyway, overall it was quite fun. I gotta say though, the references, that's the best part in my opinion. Otherwise, there were some slow parts that I wish were kind of, you know, a little condensed so that we could get to the ending quicker. The ending was amazing. That packed a punch. That took me by surprise. So I will say the ending. Stick through it for the ending. In fact, my friend Teresa was struggling. I had already finished it. And she's like, uh, I'm reading the book. I'm having a little trouble. There's parts that are slow, but other parts that are good. And I said, you've got to push through. The ending comes through. And she said, okay. And so then she called me a couple of days later and said I finished it and you're right the ending was awesome and I was thinking about it a lot afterwards and just wish it would have gotten to that quicker wish we had some more details even surrounding the ending but we actually had a great conversation analyzing everything like what did this mean what did that mean could it, this be the case that was going on could that be the case blah, blah blah so lots to dissect if you do get through the book I do say I would recommend it but you got to be uh, in for a slow burn you got to know that it's kind of a quiet horror for the most part and then it revs up you know closer to the end so I gave that a 3.5 on Goodreads I rounded it up to a 4 but 3.5 overall next book here I... It's so hard to talk about this book. Okay, so Toy Cemetery by William W. Johnstone, my first William W. Johnstone read. And it did not disappoint in the sense that it was indeed batshit crazy, which everyone kept saying how insane it was. I will say some readers might find themselves disappointed, though, in that they might not think it's all that it was made out to be. Like, you know, Grady Hendrix really touts this as being a super insane, crazy read, and it is. But there are elements that I do find to be not as satisfying as I would want it to be. And I will say the writing style is trash. Uh, I'm not trying to overly bash William W. Johnstone. I mean, he's written a ton of work, but I just don't think the writing quality is is the best. It's It could be better. It's a little flawed. And I think it's chunky. I think it's jumpy and chunky at the same time. And it's just all over the place sometimes. And he's got these great, weird, zany ideas. But I feel like Johnstone doesn't accurately combine them together to make it perfectly fluid and perfectly work together. So you got these great ideas, but the execution isn't there necessarily. And so what you're left with is stuff that just doesn't make sense. But, you know, this is not about sense. This book isn't for making sense and being like a clean, you know, nice and tidy good time with like a, you know, a great sensible ending, whatever. It's not about that at all. It's about being wild, being crazy, throwing everything, see what sticks. Like I said, you are left with stuff like, okay, this characterization element doesn't make sense at all because I remember this character saying this and acting like this and it doesn't match up with, you know, with what ended up happening with the character, yada yada. It doesn't match up with the developments etc cetera, etc cetera. there's stuff that's just dropped not followed through there's stuff that like happens at one point and then stuff that doesn't happen at other points and like you know together you're like oh it's weird it doesn't make sense i will say if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this and you want to actually experience me experiencing reading this for the first time i did my very first reading vlog about this book and it was a lot of fun actually and i threw in a whole bunch of random footage of like you know my daily life like hanging out with my dog jackson eating dinner blowing up that big roach inflatable pool float that i used in my nest video because as i was reading this i was you know filming that video and preparing for that video review for my youtube channel so i've got some cool footage of that but really it's more about my interaction with the book, my reaction as I'm reading the book and just how wild it was and how I was like, what? 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 It was really just like a WTF type of read. But again, I would think that, I, I really do think that some readers might be disappointed in this because it's so touted. It's so kind of built up and I don't know if it would meet everyone's expectations. It really depends on the reader. So I'd say like, you know, read, but you're taking a risk because you might be like kind of disappointed afterwards. However, I I just thought it was a lot of fun. There were things that I wish could have been better. A lot of things, actually. As far as my rating goes, I gave it a 3.5, rounded up on Goodreads to a 4. It was really difficult as hell to rate this. Just like Let's Go Play at the Adamses. A lot of these old school paperbacks are difficult to read because some of them aren't written in the best way. But at the same time, they are entertaining. So it's like, how do you 
reconcile that? How do you make a review about that? Like, where you enjoyed it in terms of it was entertaining, made you want to turn the pages, but at the same time, you know, there might be some big flaws too. Again, I'll have more about this. And as you can see, I still have tabs in this book. I did not read any quotes during my reading vlog. However, I'm thinking about doing a series where I sometimes read quotes, and I'm going to call it Kelsey Quotes. A nice little, very nice sound there, Kelsey Quotes. It's very nice alliteration type of thing. But I was thinking I was going to read some of the quotes, and they're not really spoilers. And I was going to do a whole, like, Toy Cemetery Kelsey Quotes, or Kelsey Quotes Toy Cemetery. If you guys would be interested in that, please let me know down below in the comments. It would mean a lot because I like to do videos that you actually want to see. So if you do want to see that, there are some funny quotes in here that I think you would enjoy just hearing and some nonsensical writing that I would highlight that I think you guys would like. So let me know if you want that. And that could be a video I do like, you know, in a month or two. Moving right along here. So the very next read I did was for my book club. I run a horror book club and I'm very proud to lead it. And it's going really well so far. We've only had one book read as a group, and that was Later by Stephen King. And I actually didn't vote for this. I actually even didn't even nominate this. My co- the co-leader, my friend Kat, I love Kat, she nominated this book. And I do love Stephen King. I just read The Stand and absolutely loved it, except for the end. I mean, there's always something that you could criticize in a Stephen King book. Some of the books, there's more to criticize than others, but there's always something to enjoy at the same time. So not only, there might be some negatives here and there, and there are some people who don't like them, but I traditionally love Stephen King. And so for all the negatives that might pop up, there's so much to like at the same time. And the same is true for later. So later isn't my favorite Stephen King read. I did have some criticisms. The end felt very loose and quickly wrapped up and just, I didn't like the end at all. I will say there was a reveal at the end that a lot of people were shocked by and their mind was blown. It didn't really blow my mind because it felt like an element that you would find in an old school horror story and it didn't bother me, but some people were really disturbed by a certain reveal at the end. I was not. And again, this book is not really a horror story, even though the main character in the book, Jamie, who's actually got this wonderful gift where he can, I mean, part of it's wonderful because it's helpful, but other parts of it are scary. So he's got this gift where he can see recently deceased people and actually talk with them. And the thing that makes this different from The Sixth Sense, let's say, is that Jamie finds out, I guess through talking with dead people, that they can't lie to him. So if he asks them a question, they have to tell the truth. So anyway, Jamie is kind of narrating this as if he's writing the story, like later in life and looking back on this time when he was a kid and like talking with dead people, yada yada. And uh, so in his little writing, he says, this is a horror story. He says that like 10 times. But the more he says it, and the more Stephen King writes him saying it, the more I'm like, this is not a horror story. There are horror elements though. And I didn't really expect it to be super horror heavy. It's it's listed as one of the hard case crime books, as you can see on the spine. So I knew what it was going to be going into it. I had a wonderful discussion about this with my book club. I will say, I think this is a great read for a book club because we had such a fascinating long discussion about it. It was perfect. And by the way, you might see the crease. It wasn't me. Amazon freaking delivered it like this. I'm so mad. So mad. Anyway, I'll deal with the crease. Uh, I should have asked for a refund and returned it or something, but I didn't. I didn't want to deal with it. But anyway, yeah, I'm mad about the crease. Overall though, not the best Stephen King read, but I've actually heard from people who don't usually like Stephen King that they liked this. Super fast, super quick, super easy. But I will quote my friend Rachel, who has a YouTube channel, The Shades of Orange. She said it was safe, though. And she usually doesn't like King, but she liked this one for the most part. But she did say, you know, the ending, it kind of faltered. And overall, she felt like it was Stephen King playing it safe. And I do agree with her on that. It could have taken more risks. And I feel like the novel actually focused on the wrong antagonist. There's two kind of bad, I guess you could call them people. One is more of the villain, but I feel like the other one should be more focused on. Whereas we're left with more questions at the end that than we are left with answers. And so that, that bothers me a little bit. But overall, decent read. Definitely fun. Definitely a page turner. Definitely easy to read. So if you're kind of on the fence about it, just read it. It took me like a day and I never read things that quickly. So I rated it a four star rating out of five. And that's flat. I did not round it up or down. It was four stars on Goodreads and four stars in general. That's what I rated it. 
All right, guys, we're almost done. Don't worry. So this is really cool. I love that I read these two books in the same month. So I just said that I read William W. Johnstone's Toy Cemetery. Then another author who's kind of known for being a little bit crazy and writing wild stories is Graham Masterton. So I read my first Graham Masterton book in the same month I read a, my first William W. Johnstone book, and my Masterton book was Walkers! I honestly freaking loved this book. Um, it was enjoyable. There were some parts that felt kind of long, but I will say the difference in the writing is so apparent from like the first three pages. It's clear between Johnstone and Masterton who the better writer is, and it's Masterton. So I will say, so all of the faults of Johnstone, like he had the awesome crazy plot ideas, he had the wild stuff, but he didn't have that execution. Whereas Masterton did. He tied things together and I loved the end. I thought the ending was really cool and, you know, left you wondering certain things and you're like, what, what? Just, it was a, it was a, it was a good ending. I, I liked it a lot. And, uh, I don't know. It had a lot of gore. I will say this had more gore than the Toy Cemetery book. I thought this had some wonderful passages and very vivid descriptions about people being pulled into cement. People being, like, shredded apart. Like, skin getting flayed off. Oh, it was gross! In a wonderful way. It was so gross. Uh, I loved it. So yeah, I would totally recommend this book. I do think it's a good place to start if you're trying to get into Masterton, but he's got lots of great books I've heard. In fact, I do plan on eventually reading his book Mirror, and there's a whole bunch of others. I'm kind of starting to keep my eye out when I go to my used bookstore that I always go to, and if I ever go to any more bookstores out of town, I'm going to keep an eye out for any titles that are by Masterton, and I'm also still collecting stuff by Johnstone too. In fact, uh, going back to Johnstone for a minute, I am going to read, I just picked up, and this is a kind of a sneak peek at one of the books I'm going to reveal in a future book haul. I bought his book Carnival. I'm trying to collect like carnival themed books right now because I would love to do a thematic month of reading that's all about carnival. Like there's this awesome Diane Ho book called Funhouse. It's a point title. I might read that. There's a carnival like I just mentioned by John Stone. There's a whole bunch. I've been trying to like collect a few. Even some kid books that are carnival themed and young adult books that are carnival themed. I'm trying to do a whole wild, wide array of of fun house, fair, carnival type of reads. Don't know what I'm gonna do, it'd be great for August, but I might not even get to this whole thematic read till next year, we'll see. Another book which I don't have like in front of me, but it's over there on my desk. It's called The Eyes of the Beast by Steve Harris. It was originally published under the name Adventureland in the UK, but uh, I definitely want to read that. It's got a carnival kind of backdrop to it, I think, a fair type of backdrop. Also, Something Wicked This Way Comes is on my list eventually. That one would fit the bill for like a carnival themed read. That would be a lot of fun. So yeah, I've got all of these plans, but let's see if John Stone's Carnival is just as mismatched and weird as Toy Cemetery. I bet it is, because I don't think his writing style really differs very much from what I have read people say on other reviews of other books written by him. We'll see though. But I'm definitely, definitely invested in Masterton's work. Can't wait to keep checking out more. I'd love to read The Manitou. I'd love to read. God, there's so many of his books I'd love to read. It, I, it'd take me forever to list them all right now. So, for now, though, Walker's was a great choice. I'm so glad I read it. I really picked it out mostly for the cover because I love shapes coming out of walls, like people coming out of walls and stuff. All right, in the back... The Oaks. The huge old building is decrepit but gorgeous, just the place for Jack Reed to build a posh country club. But the old sanitarium holds a deadly secret within its ornately carved walls. Sixty years ago, the psychopaths who filled its halls mysteriously disappeared and have never been found. Now the empty rooms echo to the soundless screaming of a madman trapped inside the brick and plaster, walking endlessly through the maze that is the Oaks. Here ring the terrified shrieks of a little boy, Jack's son, dragged into the hellish prison of the walls, held hostage by Quintus Miller, leader of the insane. So that's not really giving anything away. There's tons more that happens after that. It's just the back of the book that I read you. Uh, I would recommend it. I gave it a four star rating. So a flat four stars. I did not round it up, round down. Four stars out of five. Super enjoyable, really gory. 
very descriptive. All right, so after walkers, I wanted something shorter, so I picked up another Goosebumps, and I'm trying to go in order for my little project. So because I just had read number five, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, I went to number six, Let's Get Invisible. And as you can see, the tagline says, now you see him, now you don't. That makes sense. Let's get invisible. You see him one second, you don't see him another second, he's invisible! Alright, so it says on the back, Disappearances can be deadly. On Max's birthday, he finds a sort of magic mirror in the attic. It can make him become invisible. So Max and his friends start playing Now You See Me, Now You Don't. Until Max realizes that he's losing control. Staying invisible a little too long. Having a harder and harder time coming back. Getting him invisible is turning into a very dangerous game. The next time Max gets invisible, will it be forever? So, I will say though, I didn't think this was as creepy of a premise as some other Goosebumps books. Some are more, you know, some are more just eerie than others. Some are more scary than others. You know, they're all kid horror, so it's, none of them are really scary scary. But like, if you compare it to Welcome to Dead House, I do feel like Let's Get Invisible is not as scary as that one at all. I feel like Welcome to Dead House actually is probably the scariest Goosebumps that I've read so far in terms of how descriptive it is in its horror. There's some like parts where like it has to do with faces and it's really gross and descriptive for a Goosebumps book. I wish kind of more of them were like that but alas a lot of them are more subdued and I do feel like Let's Get Invisible the premise is a more subdued topic like you know going invisible how's that scary but it started to pick up around page 70. It really took some surprising turns things started to develop and go faster in the plot and I will say the ending blew me away it was just superbly written that last page there's like a little thing at the last page it was wonderful and that really I don't know made it an extra enjoyable experience so yeah once I got more into it I just picked back up and again I said it earlier no Goosebumps read is unenjoyable so you're always going to have a good time it's always an easy read so it's never like oh I hate this this is dragging it's never like that so even though I said this is more subtle it didn't mean that it was a bad time at all I thoroughly had a blast and I rated it four stars because especially the ending was a plus. I love the ending. And finally, the very last read, my 13th read, and 13's my lucky number because I was born on a Friday the 13th, is The Rue by Alan Baxter. So although it might look like an old school horror book to you, it might look like an old school animal attack book, no! It's a new book uh, and it's wonderful. It's written though with a old school vibe and that's on purpose. And if you read the author's foreword, he'll explain all about how the joke, it started with like an article about a kangaroo attack I think or an aggressive kangaroo and it kind of turned into people joking about what if there was a horror novel about a killer kangaroo the gore is amazing and incredible and very in your face I love that about it heads were popped off of bodies as you know easily as you would pick a grape off of a vine awesome but I will say so not only did it have the gore that I love and it had like you know the blood it did have a nice little heart to the story it also examined like life in a small town it took place in Australia obviously you would maybe assume that from the killer animal being a kangaroo but the cool thing is uh, Alan Baxter uses a lot of Australian slang because he is Australian and he provides a glossary in the back which I thought was delightful how wonderful I read that before I even read the book I read the glossary because he he mentions it in his foreword that he included a glossary of slang and oh it's wonderful I love the way they talk I used to be obsessed with the crocodile hunter and I remember this is not a joke I actually did this I actually printed out like a 30 page document which had all kinds of Australian words and as a kid I was like trying to use them because I was so obsessed with the crocodile hunter I like wanted to talk like him I just I loved everything about the show and my cousin Dana and I would pretend and play crocodile hunter and we'd have like stuffed animals that we would pretend were gators we're like jump on the gator we need more weight more weight and we'd pile onto the stuffed animal oh it was so much fun kids are nuts uh it was a good time though you could be silly and you had not a care in the world wonderful good times back in the uh late 90s early 2000s i can't remember exactly the time frame of when i was obsessed with the cro crocodile hunter but yeah it was a good time nonetheless so i highly recommend this book it's one of my favorite reads out of all these 13 books, this, Walkers, The Elementals, I had a lot of good reads, but this one's up there. It was so quick and so easy to finish. 
but it also had um, a focus on domestic violence against women. I thought that was wonderful that Alan Baxter chose to use his book to highlight that problem because apparently not only obviously it is a problem in America here but he said it's also a big problem in Australia domestic violence against women and like you know violence between husband and wife that sucks that that exists I'm so glad that he highlighted that and shined a light on that in the story so good book more than just the horror element, more than just the silly creature attack element, it had some heart too. And uh, some of the characters in the book are actually other horror authors. He, he actually used real life people as characters. That's pretty cool. Names, not like personalities, but wonderful. Okay, guys, I'm so sorry. That's it. That was the whole wrap up. I'm sorry it was so long. Thank you so much for watching. I know your time is valuable. Let's quickly talk about my June TBR. And I'm already reading stuff from my June TBR because we're already into June. So I'm reading currently Beach Party by Arl Stein. It's my first point read. It's so marvelous. I'm having a wonderful time. It's knocking my socks off with just the nostalgic feels and just, <laughs> it just is wonderful. The 90s flair and it's, it's amazing. And it's very summery and that's why I picked it up because I was like, I want to read some summer stuff. I want to get those beachy vibes and obviously Beach Party has those beachy vibes, hence the title. And it's just got a lot of teenage drama and Oh, it's wonderful. It's so cheesy, but in a wonderful, great, pleasing way. And a very, like I said, kind of a kind of way that makes you long for days past. Okay, so I'm also currently reading The Complete Drive-In by Joe R. Lansdale. I'm almost done with book one because this is a collection of all three drive-in movies. <laughs> drive-in movies. All three drive-in books written by Joe Lansdale. And I am loving the first one so far. I only like have 20 or so pages left. I'm kind of going between this one and Beach Party. I don't know why I'm doing that. I just think it's it's kind of making it more fun actually. This one I would say is more weird fiction than it is horror and that's no surprise. A lot of people have said that. I mean you could even tell that when you read the back a little bit. There is some gore described in the book though and there is some scary stuff so it definitely has horror elements but it also has sci-fi feel and just a weirdness about it as I said. Uh, I love it. I don't know though if I'm going to continue on with the drive in two and three for this summer. I may just stop at book one and then continue on maybe at a later time. I, I haven't decided yet. I would like to go through the whole thing, but you know, the whole thing's a lot longer than just book one. I mean, there's hundreds more pages if I continue on, and I've got so much to read. Speaking of having so much to read, that brings me to my next book on my list, which I have not started yet. I'm going to be rereading. Harry Potter, number five, The Order of the Phoenix. I love Harry Potter. I love all the books and I've been enjoying my reread, which has been a project I've been working on for the last, gosh, three years or so. So last year I reread The Goblet of Fire and it was one of the best reread experiences I've ever had. Now we'll admit I haven't reread a lot of books in my lifetime, but uh, The Goblet of Fire is up there with, you know, among the few rereads I've done because there's just this part where, you know, Harry, and Ron's mom are interacting and there's this really sweet moment between them and it like really made me like kind of tear up a little bit. It was just really sweet. Uh, I just, I, I loved especially the end of Goblet of Fire. I liked it actually better than the first time I read it because that was so many years ago. It just hit different I think when I reread it last year. So it's not that I'm not excited to reread this, it's just that it is so flippin' chunky and long and friggin' it's like an epic. It's one of the longest Harry Potter books in the whole series. So I'm like, gosh darn it, why this month? I'm saying why this month because you would think, Kelsey, you can control what you read, right? Well, my wonderful co-worker, Angela, she suggested we do the, the Harry Potter reread together this summer. But yeah, I wish this could have waited till next year, but I'm still gonna love it. I know I'm gonna have a great time. Harry Potter never disappoints. Such a wonderful series, so heartfelt, so enjoyable, pleasing, very relaxing too, um, in a way. I mean, I know a lot of bad stuff does develop, but it's still very comforting because you read it and you just feel like you know these characters. You grew up with these characters. I've spent so much time, not just with the book characters, but with the movie characters, that it is a very 
nice feel when you get to go back to the characters yet again for another time. So I am looking forward to it, but I just hope I can get through it quickly so I can get to all my other reads. Another book that I'm reading, which I don't have a physical copy of, but here is the awesome cover that I'll show you. It is called Razor Blades in My Head by Donnie Goodman, and he's a good guy. I can't wait to read this book. The cool thing about it is one of the short horror stories included in the book is wrestling themed so professional wrestling themed i used to cover wrestling and some of you guys did follow me back then so if you're still with me watching this now thank you so much for sticking with me but i have a lot of wrestling fans who follow me so i'm thinking they're gonna love this book i'm gonna review it on the channel can't wait to get to that the cover is amazing it blew me away when i saw this cover and donnie was nice enough to give me a digital copy to read so i could review it and I'm going to try to do that in like a week or two around the time that it is actually, you know, released. Okay, and so I mentioned I run a horror book club, and luckily I nominated this, and my book club voted my way! I mean, I kind of made it known that I really wanted this one to win. So this is Video Night by Adam Caesar. I will definitely be reading this this month because it is this month's book club book. And so we are going to talk about it actually, I think it's like June 24th, so I have to have it read before that, and I know I'll get it done. I'm very excited about it. My friend Dave said it's the craziest thing ever. He's only read like the first four chapters. I will say though that Dave's not a big horror reader, so I don't know to take that like at face value or not. And I don't know if he means good crazy or bad crazy. So, but to me, I'm sure it'll be good crazy because I'll be like, oh, this is wild. This is wonderful. So a lot of people know Adam Caesar's, you know, clown in the cornfield. However, I wanted to start with this one. It has like horror movie elements listed in it. Like the group gets together. It's about a group of kids who are gathering together and they are watching horror movies and then pardon the expression shit hits the fan i think some kind of like alien attack starts to happen and they have to deal with facing all of these creatures and trying to save i think save the town so it's described as john hughes meets john carpenter and that to me is just an amazing description and it makes me want to read it more than anything else in the entire world because I love John Hughes movies and I love John Carpenter movies so I'm like what could be better than that if you're like comparing the book to both of those freaking monster filmmakers like what it's got to have some good vibes and some really neat and spooky elements too so yeah I'm pretty freaking pumped for this and I'm so glad my book club voted for it I was so afraid because some of my horror book club aren't that into horror I don't understand it, but that is where we are right now. So hopefully they'll be okay with the horror that's in this book because our last book later, as I discussed earlier in this video, I know it's a lot lighter than what's going to be in this. And it's a lot less horror heavy than I think this will be. So hopefully everyone will enjoy it and they won't think it's a bad pick. I'm confident it's going to be enjoyable. I just don't know how they're going to feel about it. If they're going to be like offended or not like it. We'll see. I hope we have as good of a discussion about this because we had a great discussion. Very in-depth and just... It, w it was really wonderful because it really had all of your synapses like firing and just it was very pleasing to speak so intelligently with other people about a book so hopefully we have the same type of good discussion with this one i'm really really hoping so got my fingers crossed so that was it for like my cemented reads i am going to try to throw in some random stuff here and there i would love to get to some fear street books this summer also hopefully in june i could start to continue with my goosebumps reads and of course i'm going to keep going in order so the next one will be number seven night of the living dummy and that should be a lot of fun. I'm probably just going to throw that in whenever I can. It's short, easy, as we've been talking about this whole video. And then July, the only things I have cemented for sure, I'm going to be doing a shark marathon with my friend Nathaniel Toll, who wrote Pumpkin Cinema. So I'm going to definitely be reading Jaws 2. And to go with it, I'm going to be probably skipping a few books ahead because I have a feeling I won't be up to speed on number 19. Although I'm trying to go in order, I think it'll be okay. I'm going to read Deep Trouble along with Jaws 2, and that should be a lot of fun. This is one of the ones I actually did read as a kid. I actually not only read it, I also listened to it. There was an audio cassette tape back when we had audio cassettes and everything. There was a tape where someone read it, and I had that tape, and so I actually listened to it and, you know, read it along with the tape. So that should be a lot of fun. I don't really remember anything about it, though, so it's not like 
I'm gonna be rereading it and remembering every single detail. It'll probably be like I'm reading it for the first time. Then finally, I would love to get to this in July, Kill River by Cameron Robeek, heard great things. And that's all I have cemented so far. Who knows what I'm gonna get to the rest of June, July, and August. I'm just excited. I do want a lot of summary things as I've been saying this whole time. So hopefully I can find a few more things here and there. I've been buying left and right. I should be able to find some stuff. I have been buying with summer in mind, so I've been picking up some beachy and heat things. We'll see uh, what I get to. As you guys know, I'm a slow reader. As I said in the beginning, don't even know if I'm going to get to it, but that's it for me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed my picks. Again, please comment if you've read any of these, what you thought of the books, if you did read them, and if you haven't read any of these, which ones are you most interested in? Is there a particular one that interests you the very most? Leave it in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed, please leave a like. Remember to subscribe and hit that bell so you never miss a video that I upload. Appreciate you guys so much. Till next time though, keep on killing it.